Well, let's open our Bibles to Job chapter 25. Job chapter 20. Well, I see a few of us got our Christmas presents wrapped and the trees up. Everyone else is home scrambling tonight, I'm sure. Uh, last time we were together, we began the third and final round of dialogue or discussion between Job and his three friends. It began back in chapter 22. And Job had declared that he would gladly stand before God and argue or plead his case to God. And when God heard his case, that God would certainly vindicate him and prove his innocence. And as a result of that, God began to look to Job. Uh, I mean, Job began to look for God, excuse me. Uh, Job looked in front of him, Job looked behind him, Job looked to his right, and Job looked to his left, but God could not be found. Uh, Job should have simply looked up, amen? Okay, yeah, he blew that one. But he came to the conclusion, and we saw last time we were together, that God really allowed all of these things to happen in his life to test him, to try him, to temper him, to grow him, to mature him. And I got to tell you, in thinking about that, that sure blessed my heart in understanding that God allows us to go through difficulties too. In fact, we're going to see a little more of that in our text today. Now, this brings us to chapters 25 through 28 in our study for today. And if you're taking notes or outlining our text, uh, we're going to be looking at two things. First of all, we're going to see that Bildad answers Job. That's in chapter 25. And then second, we'll see that Job answers Bildad. That's in chapters 26 through 31. Though today we'll simply be looking uh, uh, 26 through 28. Lord willing, we'll look at chapters 29 30 and 31 next time we're together and conclude Job's final discourse. So let's drop back and take a look at this first section. It's chapter 25 of Bild as Bildad answers Job. And this, by the way, is the shortest answer that Job gets. It's only six verses, which of course becomes very appropriate because it comes from the shortest man in the Bible. Yeah, look at verse 1 of chapter 25. It says, then Bildad the Shoe height. <laughs> no. <laughs> Ooh, I know that was bad. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, you just got it. Fine. Yeah, Bill Dad, the shoe height. Okay, he's the smallest guy in the Bible. Okay, that's a Bible trivia question for you guys. Now, uh, there are two things involving Bill Dad's answer to Job. Number one, we see that Bill Dad states a truth. Number one, Bill Dad states a truth. Look at verses one through three. It says that Bill Dad the Shuhite answered and said, Dominion and fear belong to him, speaking of God. He, God, makes peace in his high places. Is there any number to his armies? No, of course not. Upon whom does his light not rise? The answer is nobody. Now here Bildad states an obvious truth about God, that God is large and in charge. God is in absolute total control of everything and everyone all the time. And you know, this should bring great peace and rest to all of our hearts. Because as Job is going through difficulties, well, the truth of the matter is, so do we. Hello. Okay, three of us are anyway. Okay, fine. Uh, the rest of you are dismissed. But the truth of the matter is when we go through difficult times, we need to come to that conclusion as well, that God is in total control. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 1.11 that God is working all things according to the counsel of His will. Well, that's the truth that Bildad states. Now, let's come to the second thing in chapter 25. And here we see Bildad ask a question. So number one, Bildad states a truth, but number two, Bildad asks a question. Uh, that's in verses four through six. In Job 25, four, it says, how then can man be righteous before God? Or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? If even the moon does not shine and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is a maggot, and the son of man, who is a worm. Job, how on earth do you think 
you're going to stand and plead your case before God. How can you stand before a righteous God? Look, not even the moon and the stars can achieve that task. So what makes you think you're going to stand before God? Now that's the question, which by the way, is a very good question. <laughs> it's a very good question, and it's an important question for its at least two reasons. Number one, because none of us are righteous. Now, I realize it's a Christmas season, and, and, and I'm not here to burst anybody's bubble, but, but none. Of, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, that there is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, Romans 3, 23 says, uh, we all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God. In fact, Job brings up the issue of being born. He says, how can he be pure who is born of a woman. Now David picks up on that, by the way, in Psalm 51. Because in Psalm 51, 5, David said he was born into sin. He was conceived in iniquity in his mother's womb. So all of us are born sinners. So the first problem we have in light of standing before a righteous God is number one, none of us are righteous. But number two, it involves the fact we're all going to stand before God. Saint and sinner alike. Everyone's going to stand before God. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, that non-believers will stand before what's called the great white throne of judgment. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we're told that believers will stand before the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ. So all of us are going to stand before God, saint and sinner alike. So the question is, how can we be righteous enough to stand before a righteous and holy God. <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. There, <laughs> there's only one way. It's through Jesus Christ. It's through the finished work of Christ on the cross, through his vicarious or substitutional death for you and for me, as he shed his blood on Calvary's cross over 2,000 years ago. He not only enables us to have our sins forgiven and forgotten, 1 John 1, 9, Hebrews 10, 17, Psalm 103, 12, but He also gives us His Holy Spirit to live inside of us, Romans 8, 11, Acts 5, 32, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. But there's a third thing that Jesus did. He imputed God's righteousness to each and every one of us as believers. You know, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So now we have God's righteousness credited to our account. And now, and only now, can we stand before a righteous and holy God. Well, that concludes this first section dealing with Bildad's answer to Job. Now, this brings us to the second and final section we want to look at in our study today, and that deals with Job's answer to Bildad. It's here in chapters 26 through 28, though it, of course, will continue through chapter 31. More on that next time we're together. Now, there are actually seven different things we want to look at and learn about as it pertains to Job answering Bildad. Seven things. Number one, first of all, we see Job's sarcastic reply. Uh, that's in verses one through four. Job has a very sarcastic reply to Bildad. Take a look. In Job 26, one, it says, but Job answered and said, how have you helped me who is without power? Now he's speaking of himself because he's powerless at this point. How have you saved the arm that has no strength? How have you counseled one who has no wisdom? And how have you declared sound advice to many? To whom have you uttered words? And whose spirit came from you? Bildad, you've been speaking a lot of truth. You've spouted a lot of facts. But all of your words haven't helped me at all. 
Your words haven't brought me comfort or consolation. You know I'm weak. You know I'm spent. You know I've lost my family. I've lost my home. I, I'm losing my very life. I'm covered with boils from head to toe. And all the truth that you've spouted, all of the facts that you've spoke forth, haven't done a thing for me. That's kind of the, the jest behind this sarcastic reply of Job to Bildad. And if there's a, a lesson to be learned for us, it's a simple one to be sure. Look, when people are hurting, when someone's going through a difficult time, we can speak forth truth. We can spout facts. We can quote Bible verses. But the question is, are the words we speak in to them going to bring comfort? Are they words of love? Are they words of compassion? Words of consolation? It's interesting at the end of verse 4, he says, and whose spirit came from you? In other words, <laughs> you're not speaking by the spirit of God, we might say. You're speaking by the spirit of man because all you're doing is giving me facts. You're not giving me love. If you were speaking by the spirit of God, you would be giving me love because according to uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Look, when we're speaking by the Spirit of man, when someone's going through a difficult time, oftentimes we just want to smack them upside their pointy little head and say, knock it off. Get back to it. Straighten up, kind of a thing. Rather than exhibiting compassion and love. So the first thing involves Job's sarcastic reply. Number two. The second thing involves Job's description of God. Job's description of God. That's in verses 5 through 14, the end of the chapter. In chapter 26, verse 5, he goes on to say, The dead tremble, those under the waters and those inhabiting them. Sheol is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. He, speaking of God, stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. He covers the face of his throne and spreads his clouds over it. He drew a circular horizon on the face of the water. Wow, this points to the fact that the earth is round, by the way. Very interesting uh, fact. And the bounty of light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. Now the pillars of heaven speak of mountains um, because the mountains are like pillars that are holding up the heaven and they tremble, they, they quake. Verse 12, he stirs up the sea with his power and by his understanding he breaks up the storm by his spirit. He adorned the heavens. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Indeed, these are mere edges of his ways and how small a whisper we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand it? Now, back in chapter 25, verses 1 through 3, Bildad mentions God's power, but here Job really expounds on God's power, pointing out the fact that God is all powerful. He's all powerful over Sheol, speaking of things under the earth. He's all powerful over the mountains and the sea, speaking of things on the earth. And he's all powerful over the stars and the sky, speaking of things above the earth. It points to the omnipotence of God, the fact that God is all powerful and he is over all things. And yet he said in verse 14, man can only understand the mere edge of his ways. We only comprehend just a small whisper of his voice. In other words, there's no way we can fully understand God. Now, while Job might understand a little bit more about God than his three friends, his three friends, clearly he doesn't fully understand that it is God who is allowing all of this to happen in his life. Now, there's a couple important truths here. Number one, it is foolishness for us to think that somehow we can figure out God. Now, there's a lot of smart people here, I'm sure. I are not one of them. <laughs> okay, amen, fine. But there's no way we can ever comprehend God because God is infinite and we are finite. 
Now, we might be able to apprehend some things about God because the Bible teaches it and we believe it, but we can never comprehend all there is to know about God. And the second important truth is that we don't understand all there is to know about God as it pertains to His dealings with our lives. Now, we get a little glimpse here in Job's life because we've read the story from cover to cover. We, we read the first couple of chapters that told us very clearly that it was God who allowed Satan to come against Job. It was God who allowed all of the trial, all of the tribulation, all of the tumult to come into Job's life. And yet, Job doesn't have that understanding. He doesn't have the full picture at this point like we do. And God has truly blessed us to be able to see that even though we're going through difficult times, even though there's trials and tribulation, unlike Job thinks, God is really watching over him. God is really with him. Because sometimes when we go through difficulties in our lives, we feel like God's far away. Like somehow he's left us or abandoned us. But you know that nothing can be further from the truth. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, God said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So while we might not be able to comprehend all there is to know about God, we can just understand the mere ed edges of His ways and the whisper of His thundering voice. We know He's always with us and He's always watching over us. Well, let's come to the third thing we want to look at. And that involves the fact that Job's integrity is intact. Number three, Job's integrity is intact. That's in chapter 27, verses 1 through 6. In Job chapter 27, verse 1, it says, Moreover, Job continued his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my justice, and the mighty, and the almighty, who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me, and the breath of my God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Right on, Job. Good job. Man, God is allowing all of this to happen to me in my life. And even though, man, I, my life is upside down, I will not speak wickedness nor utter deceit. This is a good reminder for us. Because sometimes when things go south in our life, we like to shake our fist at God and say something rash. But when we truly understand that God's on the throne, that He's either allowing it to happen or He's making it happen, either way it's being filtered through the fingertips of God. Look, if we're a child of God, if we're born again, if Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, yeah, we're going to go through difficult times. In fact, in John 16, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. Look, it's only a matter of time until our life is virtually upside down like Job's. Woo. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, when that happens, we understand that God is allowing it to happen. It's all being filtered through His fingertips, so we don't utter wickedness. We don't speak forth words of deceit. We simply say, okay, God, I'm going to go with the flow. Whatever you want to do, however you want to work in my life. Now, I, I, it's simple in that respect. God's made life very simple. Now, I didn't say easy. I, I said simple. And truly, it is simple when we look at it in light of that truth. Well, this section goes on. Look at verse 5. It says, Far be it from me that I should say, You are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast, and I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach or reprove me as long as I live. Now, Job's making a pretty incredible statement here about the fact that his integrity is still intact. Even though he was going through an incredibly difficult time, he wasn't going to speak evil or wickedness against God. Now, he is not saying that he's perfect. Don't misunderstand. He's not saying that he's perfect. He's simply saying he's not perfect. 
harboring the secret sin that his three friends say that he is harboring. And so ultimately, the point here regarding his integrity being in, 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 intact is that he has a clear conscience before God. He's got a clear conscience before God. And if we can apply it to our lives, and I believe we can, None of us are perfect, just like Job. We all have our faults, we all have our flaws, we all have our failures. Just ask the person sitting next to you, they'll be glad to let you know how messed up you really are. None of us are perfect, but hopefully, because of who we are in, through, and because of Christ, by the power of His Spirit, we mess up a little less today than we did yesterday and the day before and the day before. So hopefully our conscience is clear before God. And when that's the case, when we really give our life to Jesus Christ, even though we recognize we, we fall short and, and we do things we ought not to, we confess, we repent, we get right with God, our conscience becomes clear. And as a result of that, there's now no more condemnation, no more heaviness. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I say praise God to that. Number four. Let's come to the fourth thing we want to look at. And here we see Job's words to the wicked. Number four. We see Job's words to the wicked. Uh, that's in verse 7 down through verse 23, the end of the chapter. In chapter 27, verse 7, he says, May my enemy be like the wicked, and he who rises against me like the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he may gain much, if God takes away his life? <laughs> Will God hear his cry when trouble comes upon him? No, of course not. Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call on God? No. I will teach you about the hand of God, what is with the Almighty, I will not conceal. Surely all of you have seen it. Why then do you behave with complete nonsense? This is the portion of the wicked man with God and the inheritance of the oppressor received from the Almighty. If his children are multiplied, it is for the sword, and his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread. Those who survive him shall be buried in death, and their widows shall not weep. Though he heaps up silver like dust and piles up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the just will wear it, and the innocents will divide the silver. He builds his house like a moth, like a booth which, is, which a watchman makes. The rich man will lie down, but not be gathered up. He opens his eyes, and he is no more. Terrors overtake him like a flood. A tempest steals him away in the night. The east wind carries him away and he is gone. It sweeps him out of the, his place. It hurls against him and does not spare. He flees desperately from its power. Men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. Now here the words for the wicked are something we've already seen back in chapter 24. Job's making it very clear that wicked men and women do prosper. Man, sometimes wicked people make out like bandits while righteous people suffer horribly. That's the point. However, according to the end of this section, they're going to get what's coming to them. That's the point. Yes, the wicked may prosper in this world, but one day they're going to stand before God and give an answer for it. And that's when their prospering ways will end. And I guess for you and for me, this should bring a little bit of comfort to us because we see the wicked prospering today, do we not? We see evil men and imposters waxing worse and worse. It, it seems like they can do what they want and they're making all this money and they're making out like bandits. They're not sick and they're doing well and there's no repercussion. There's no penalty for their sin. Hey, payday one day, believe you me. While they might prosper in this world, while they might escape the clutches of the law and the retribution of man, they're going to stand before God. And God is going to render to each man, Romans 2, 6, according to his deeds. Well, let's come to the fifth thing we want to look at. We said there were seven. 
The fifth thing is here in chapter 28 where we see Job's, Job's example regarding wisdom. Job's example regarding wisdom. That's in chapter 28 verses 1 through 11. And Job is going to use the example of miners, men mining for gold and silver, as an example to point out the fact that, well, men are pretty good at finding gold, but they're not good at finding wisdom. So here's the example. In verse 1 of Job chapter 28, he said, Surely there is a, a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted for more. Man puts an end to darkness and searches every recess for ore in the darkness and the shadow of death. In other words, he digs deep holes and finds all this precious metal. Verse 4, he breaks open a, a shaft away from people and places forgotten by feet. They hang far away from men. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, from it comes bread. But unearthed it is turned up as fire. Its stones are the source of sapphire, and it contains gold dust. That path no bird knows, nor has the falcon's eye seen it. In other words, it's deep underground. The proud lions have not trodden it, nor has the fierce lion passed over it. He puts his hand on the flint. He overturns the mountains at the, at the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks. And his eye sees every precious thing. He dams up the streams from trickling. What is hidden, speaking of the gold, he brings forth to light. So Job's example regarding wisdom is speaking to the fact that man is pretty good at finding very expensive metals. And he finds them, he's good at it. But finding wisdom, well, that's another story altogether, which brings us to the sixth point, the sixth section. And that involves Job's truth about wisdom. Number six, Job's truth about wisdom. Uh, that's in verses 12 through 19. Take a look. In Job 28, 12, it says, But, here's the contrast, where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding. Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. And the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in the precious onyx or sapphire. Neither gold nor crystal can equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewelry of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or quartz, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. As good as man is at finding gold and buying things, <laughs> he can't buy wisdom. Wisdom can't be bought because it's not from the earth. True wisdom is not from the earth. That's the point he's making here. Paul picks up on that, by the way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, he says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Now, it's talking about spiritual wisdom. Obviously, we have wisdom on a... On a general level. I mean, it's just wise not to put your hand in a fire, you follow me? I mean, that's exercising manly or earthly wisdom. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual wisdom. In fact, James takes it a step further. In James chapter 3, verse 15, he says, wisdom that's not from above, from God, is earthly, it's sensual, it's demonic. Wow. Wow. So if wisdom doesn't come from God, apparently there's only one other source. <laughs> it's from the devil. And again, we're not talking about natural wisdom. It's just natural wisdom not to jump off a cliff because of gravity, you follow me? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual wisdom. And you know as well as I do, there's a lot of people today, the moment you talk to them about God or Jesus or the Bible... They look at you like you're from outer space. Like what in the world are you talking about? Even the simplest 
most elementary biblical concepts that little children understand. Grown adults just can't comprehend it. Why? Well, because it's spiritual wisdom. They don't have spiritual eyes. 2 Corinthians 4 uh, talks about, or is it chapter 2, verse 14, talks about the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit, nor can he know them. They're foolishness to him because they're spiritually discerned. And that's the truth about wisdom that Job pronounces. Well, let's come to the seventh and final thing, and we'll wrap this up right here. The seventh and final issue deals with Job's question about wisdom. Job's question about wisdom. And that's in verses 20 through 28, the end of the chapter. In Job 28, 20, it says, From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding or knowledge, we might say? Well, it is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Destruction and death say, we have heard a report about it with our ears. God understands its way and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heavens to establish a weight for the wind. Wow. So apparently the wind has a weight to it, and meet out the waters by measure, when he made a law for the rain and a path for the thunderbolt. Then he saw wisdom and declared it, and prepared it. Indeed, he searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding, or knowledge, we would say. So wisdom and knowledge or understanding are from God. The fear of the Lord, wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Uh, Solomon picked up on that, by the way, in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So in other words, it's just wise to have a reverential awe or to be in fear of who God is and what God is all about. Now, when it talks about being, having a fear of God, it doesn't mean we're afraid of God. It simply means we, we have a reverential awe of who He is and what God's all about. We stand in awe, a reverential fear of God. And when that is the case, according to the end of verse 28... The wisest thing we can do to understand, to have the knowledge, is to depart from evil. Don't miss how that goes together. We don't depart from evil because we're so smart or because it's something we work at or strive for. No, we have a reverential fear. We have, a, we have an awe of who God is. And with that understanding, with that knowledge, we recognize the importance of <laughs> fleeing wickedness, not doing evil, if you will. That's wisdom. And all of that is in, through, and because of God. In fact, Paul highlights this for us in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. He said, all of the treasures of God, are, all the hidden treasures are in Christ of wisdom and knowledge. They're all hidden in Christ. Wisdom and knowledge, understanding comes in, through, and because of Jesus Christ. Look, if, we, if Jesus Christ isn't the Lord of our life, if He's not ruling and reigning over every aspect of who we are and where we go and what we do, well, we're just not very wise. There's no wisdom in that. But when we, when we exercise great wisdom, allowing God to have full control of our lives, now we have the knowledge, the understanding of the importance to depart from evil. Well, next week, Lord willing, chapters 29 through 31, as we finish Job's discourse to his three friends in this third and final discourse. Father, how thankful we are. Lord, for these few short minutes, a time to be able to come and gather together, lift up our hearts, our hands to you in worship and praise through song, through the study of your word, through the fellowship we have with each other. Lord, it's just a glorious thing. And Lord, we thank you for the valuable lessons we learn through your word, through the life of Job. 
Because, Lord, we confess that oftentimes we, <laughs> we can relate to what he's going through and dealing with, the struggles and the pain and the anguish that he often feels and sometimes even expresses it. But yet, Lord, he keeps coming back around to the fact that, well, you're in control and his integrity is intact and his conscience is clear before you. Lord, help that to be true in all of our hearts, all of our lives. Lord, we realize we mess up. We stumble and fall every now and then, sometimes more than we'd like to. But Lord, by your Spirit, help us to be those who are men and women of integrity, exercising the wisdom of standing in awe of you, and having the understanding to depart from evil. Help us, Lord, we pray, just to simply go with the flow. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up after service. The pastors, the brothers and sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, and just to serve you and minister to any need you might have in your hearts and lives today. And I do pray that God would bless you, encourage you, man, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour out his spirit in your hearts and your lives. As you continue in this Christmas season, just rejoicing in the joy of Jesus. And that everybody you contact, come in contact with, man, just give them that Merry Christmas. Big hug and a big smile. Tell them Jesus loves you. <laughs> God bless you guys.